Well, for those that aren't climate scientists, I'm sure your head is already swimming. Um, at least that's what I'm told after I give a talk. <laughs> uh, I'm giving a talk at breakfast tomorrow, which will probably be the least technical talk I've ever given. So if I, if I snow you under uh, today with a, a few technical details, then I hope I can redeem myself in the morning. Uh, I'm going to build upon what Bill Kinemuth talked about, which, if I want to put it in layman's terms, um, basically the climate system, which on longer time scales is dominated by the ocean. Uh, it's a nonlinear dynamical system, so it can have chaotic variations. The IPCC doesn't believe this exists, which is ridiculous from a scientific point of view, which Bill uh, alluded to, you know, is just sort of a stupid position to take. It's a nonlinear dynamical system. Uh, it has long time scales. Uh, for instance, the thermohaline circulation, centuries to thousands of years to overturn, okay? If there are variations, as Bill Kinemuth talked about, in that, it, cha it can cause global warming or global cooling. I'll get into that um, here. But what I'm going to go over is the effect of El Nino and La Nina, which are short-term variations, only a couple of three years when we have an El Nino or a La Nina event, uh, how those events can actually cause global warming or cooling. Okay, first of all, big picture. How do you cause warming or cooling? Well, for the warming we've seen of the ocean since the 1950s, okay, and this is, this is not controversial. If you believe the warming we've seen, uh, let's say in the upper 700 meters of the ocean uh, since the 1950s, which is only about a tenth of a degree C, if you believe the measurements to a tenth of a degree C over the last 50 years, if we just take that as truth, uh, it only corresponds to an energy imbalance for the Earth of one part in a thousand. Now, do we really believe that natural chaotic variations in the climate system are incapable of causing changes of one part in a thousand? Well, that's what the IPCC assumes. And I think that's a stupid thing to assume. Okay, there's two ways for the global climate. Uh, let's talk about surface temperatures. There's two ways to change surface temperatures. One is through radiative forcing, which can be either in, let's say, warming. Warming of the surface can occur globally averaged either through an increase in absorbed sunlight or a decrease in outgoing infrared radiation, okay? The main modulation of increased sunlight absorption is clouds, and that's mainly what I'm going to talk about is the effect of cloud variations on uh, climate change. Uh, Bill Gray, when he was talking about all of the deep convection in the tropics uh, affecting the water vapor in the upper troposphere, that modulates how fast the Earth loses infrared energy to space. Those are the two kinds of energy flows which can affect surface temperatures. Incoming sunlight, outgoing infrared. Okay, so when there's a change in one of these energy flows, we call that a radiative forcing. Now, you can also have non-radiative forcing of surface temperatures. This is what Bill Kinemuth was talking about. That because the upper ocean the very, for instance, in the tropics, that, that warm water we think of for the tropical oceans is just a very thin layer sitting on the vast majority of the oceans, which are very cold. Both bills talked about this. Most of the oceans are very cold. In other words, the average temperature of the climate system is very cold because it's dominated by the oceans, which are mostly around 3 degrees C, uh, you know, the upper 30s uh, in, on the Fahrenheit scale. Uh, so anyway, if you change the amount of ocean mixing, okay, if you increase ocean mixing, as was already discussed, uh, you will cause global cooling at the surface because you're bringing up cold water faster than the average climate system uh, produces, okay? Or if you reduce the rate of overturning, you will cause global warming. 
Anyway, as I mentioned, the IPCC assumes that these four scenes are non-existent. Uh, now, one thing that's ironic about all of this, I'm going to be giving the results. This is basically a top-level presentation of a paper we published in the Asia-Pacific Journal of Atmospheric Sciences in the last year, um, where we use a one-dimensional climate model to explain ocean temperature variations over the last 50 years. Okay? Uh, the very first figure in that paper shows for the IPCC models how they have warmed or cooled the oceans in the last 50 years. And they are all over the map. And all we can figure out is that some of these climate models don't even conserve energy. I mean, if you're talking anything physics and you don't conserve energy, you're out in la-la land. I mean, that's the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and that's published, but nobody talks about it. And I call it the, the Essex effect because Christopher Essex has been talking about this for years, that you really probably can't trust climate models that have you know, daily time steps and um, finite difference equations that approximate the, the real equations that are going on. You integrate them in time, and they won't conserve energy unless you force them to. OK. Bill Kinnameth already showed this plot, uh, and I've already talked about this. You change the vertical circulation of the ocean, you can cause surface warming or cooling. All right? I think this is why the climate models, uh, this is a plot that we made of all of the climate models and how they've predicted warming uh, for the future, how they compare to surface temperatures and our satellite temperatures. There's a huge disconnect by about a factor of two. And I think this is related to the climate model's assumption that there are no natural climate variations. Okay, this is, I'm not going to go through this. I want to draw your attention to this one thing where it's got the green line. That's our fit, that's Levitas data, how much it's warmed in the oceans down to depth, down to 1,000 meters depth since the 1950s, and our model fit to that, which is very close. We calibrate the model by forcing it to change cloudiness in response to ob the observed history of El Nino and La Nina. And we end up coming up with a low climate sensitivity, only 1.3 degrees, just by including the natural effects of El Nino and La Nina. It reduces the sensitivity of the climate system compared to what the IPCC claims by 50%. That's just one natural climate phenomenon. The smoking gun for all this is stuff that I've presented at previous conferences, which is, and I'm going to deviate from Bill Kinnaman's original statement, clouds can change all by themselves, which can change the radiative heating of the surface. Okay? Uh, we found evidence of this in the satellite data from the series instruments flying on the NASA uh, Aqua spacecraft and the NASA Terra spacecraft. And what we found is that the climate model best fit the observations if cloud changes occurred approximately nine months in advance of El Nino or La Nina. In other words, when El Nino and La Nina occurs, it's a coupled ocean atmospheric thing going on. The Earth looks different slightly during El Nino than it does during La Nina, has a slightly different amount of clouds, which changes the amount of sunlight heating the oceans, which can cause global warming or cooling. So in other words, while El Nino and La Nina are mostly driven by internal circulation, we find that they're also partly about one-third driven by radiation changes because the Earth, in terms of cloudiness, looks slightly different during El Nino and La Nina. OK, so conclusion. Ocean circulation changes can cause global warming or global cooling. And it's unknown, you know, I, I mean, Bill thinks that, uh, or Bill Gray says CO2 isn't involved at all. As a scientist, I've learned that, you know, I, there aren't any absolutes, I don't think, in science. Uh, but clearly, you know, we've got proxy evidence that goes back 2,000 years that suggests, and as well as, you know, historical evidence from humans. Roman warm period, medieval warm period, these things actually occurred. There's natural variability in the climate system. And what I'm telling you is that because the ocean-dominated climate system is a nonlinear dynamical system, 
it can all by itself change circulation, which can change cloudiness, which can change the total amount of sunlight coming in and change surface temperatures. I mean, it, I don't understand why more people aren't looking at this, except it gives the wrong answer for the politicians. And without understanding long-term changes in ocean circulation, here I'm agreeing with both of you now, uh, it will remain unknown how much of climate change is natural versus human caused. It may be we'll never be able to answer the question because we don't understand chaotic variations. And that's the end. <laughs>